So, um, Steve, it's a pleasure to talk to you uh, once again. You've chaired and put together an amazing meeting, the um, David Jagelman Memorial uh, uh, Colorectal Meeting, for the first time being held in Jerusalem in conjunction with the Israeli Colorectal Society. Um, can you first tell, uh, tell me a wee bit about how the decision came to hold the meeting in Jerusalem? Well, after 30 years of holding the meeting in Fort Lauderdale, uh, and for the first uh, first four of those, 1991, David Jagelman was alive, and he took ill just after the 93 meeting, uh, and passed away before the 94 meeting, so we, we eponymously associated it with him, including the oration. Uh, and we did it uh, by ourselves, being Florida, for probably till probably around about two, let me see, 2012 or 13, and then we, f Cleveland used to have something called a Turnbull Symposium after mm -hmm. for Turnbull. They asked if they could fold in with us. We said sure. So something like 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, maybe, maybe even a bit prior to that, for a bunch of years, we did a combined meeting. Um, the, the decision was made jointly after the last year's meeting, we were going to take a hiatus and just rethink how we're doing things. Um, that was in February, March of last year. In May, I was here uh, as a guest of the Israeli Surgical Association, who's another co-sponsor of this meeting. And just in talking to the 10 or so alumni of mine who I've trained, who now run the surgical departments here in, in Shari Sedek and Safarofa, Adasa, and uh, Tel Shomer and other places, um, said, you know something, maybe we should not do the meeting with Cleveland as, as we decided already not to, but maybe we can do one with you guys, So because there were so many alumni here. So that's kind of out of all, it was literally just a hallway conversation in May, late May, and so we had June through uh, January more or less to get everything organized and, and ready. However, it, it seems to be such a success that my idea now is we'll be rotating it so on the odd numbered years back in Florida with Ohio and then the even numbered years somewhere else. We have offers now from about half a dozen other cities to host the meeting. It's because of course you, you have trained people who are now situated all over the world and of course the Cleveland Clinic has a pretty massive um, footprint. So I, I've had the pleasure of, of visiting with you in, in Western. I didn't see it when it first opened. It was like a 150 bed. One very good memory. 153 beds from literally 1990, uh, 1988 when we opened uh, until last year, the beginning of 2019. And then we had a rapid expansion. Uh, but it had always been that number. It was largely a surgical hospital uh, led by colorectal surgery and then bariatric surgery by Raul Rosenthal and uh, then orthopedics uh, led by Will Barsoom uh, mm -hmm. and others. Uh, and, and so it's, it's more lately it's more of a community and all-service hospital but that number of beds worked in the U.S. firstly because short lengths of stay yeah. and secondly because it wasn't all things to all people. So when you uh, introduced the Jagelman uh, oration, which Weil did, um, I remember you putting up a slide showing the number of institutions mm -hmm. that, under his leadership, I guess, um, uh, that you've now metastasized, if yes, you will, exactly. all, all over Florida. Yep. Um, and how many total uh, build places I, are on the location? Well, there, there's now five hospitals. So we've gone from 153 beds to just under 1,100 beds. Wow. And we had one campus back uh, 88 to 2001. Once we moved out to Weston, we had a small outpatient campus, but effective last year, um, we now have th a total of 34 outpatient campuses, so different medical office buildings and, and centers where people can be seen. They wouldn't uh, be able to have procedures, or major procedures at least, but be seen, and then people are funneled into the hospitals as necessary. Mm. So, um, you know the, these like spoof quizzes, um, and one might be, where is the Cleveland Clinic? <laughs> so, of course, obviously the, the mothership 
if you will, was in Ohio, for the benefit of people who don't know where else in the world, and then I want to come on and talk about one specific location, okay. where in the world does, does Cle the Cleveland Clinic have bases other than Florida and obviously Ohio? Well, the model that we've done in, in uh, Florida is based on what happened in Cleveland under the leadership of, of uh, Fred Loop, who was two CEOs ago, and, uh, and his, his mark was expanding within Ohio, and that was continued by Toby Cosgrove, who was the next CEO. And, and Basically, they started acquiring other hospitals, uh, Fairview, Hillcrest, and then started spreading the net, uh, Akron. So just as we're now doing in Florida, it, it's bringing hospitals into the fold, gradually changing the model so that everybody's pulling in the same direction, sharing best practices, sharing resources, sharing data, quality control, uh, but not necessarily changing the practice model um, in terms of how the doctors are compensated plus acquiring a lot of outpatient clinics. So in the greater Ohio, north, uh, in the northeastern Ohio area, it's no longer just the main campus. There's a west region and an east region, and each one has hospitals and, and, and outpatient centers. So Ohio is main campus plus the east and the west regions. Then there's Florida, which I, I just described. There's a uh, neurosciences center in Las Vegas, which is very specific to neurosciences. I've had the pleasure of meeting the, the director there, fabulous chap. Mm -hmm. actually, actually, it's an FDA hearing. Uh, fascinating gentleman. Well, that would make sense with one of your innovations. Um, and then um, Toronto, there's a family health center. Then the Cleveland Clinic Light licenses and management skills to a variety of cardiothoracic departments and also innovations, Cleveland Clinic innovations, so those are scattered around. But in terms of full campuses, the first one opened out of the U.S. is in Abu Dhabi that originally was operated out of Sheikh Khalifa Hospital but then ultimately opened as its own freestanding hospitals and that's become the first hospital in uh, that part of the world that's been doing successful liver and kidney transplants uh, at, at high level acuity care. So Abu Dhabi is a little bit different model. It's, uh, we manage it. We don't own it, as far as I know. Um, and now coming online imminently is London, uh, 33 Grosvenor Place. And um, it's, it's a nice address. And you have some nice neighbors. Somebody asked me last night, they said, is it in a good neighbor? And I said, <laughs> I shall show you a picture from the roof garden looking just east. Yes, there's a nice, nice little property there. Yes. Um, so, so, so for the benefit of anyone who, who listens to, watches this interview or, or reads it, um, go to Google Maps or Google Earth and you'll see what's next. Yeah, it's, it's quite an it's amazing address. It's a fabulous facility. And the great news is that you've just got your GMC registration, yes, your yes. General Medical Council. You're going to be a, a token Brit. Exactly. Uh, My anglophilic tendencies can be, once again, transiently fulfilled. So <laughs> Richard Cohn is our Digestive Disease and Surgical Institute Chair there. Um, and there'll be a variety of people from London uh, who will be doing cases there. I'm, I'm told Charles Knowles, for example, is one of them from Queen Mary uh, University, uh, uh, the old uh, Royal London, where Norman Williams had been, and, and some others scattered throughout the city. Um, and that's the model, with the exception of people like Richard, who would be full-time, all of the other people are going to just be bringing their private cases there to do. It's a, it's a beautiful hospital. The outpatients, the office, there are few offices on Grosvenor. The support officers are next door in number 40, which if you um, like Lebanese food, and I have no vested interest, no, as we say, conflict of interest, <laughs> but Nora Lebanese restaurant is in yeah, Ho it is. Hobart Place is in the lobby of that building. So that's the support office, but there's no patients being seen there. Right. Patients will be up in, in Portman, uh, Portland Place. Right. And there's a very nice facility just near the Charles Bell House from the okay. CL. Right, fantastic. Um, and then the next one coming online is Shanghai, which may be harder to staff in the current yes, environment. There was about a month ago we, on our intranet, there was a posting for chief of staff at uh, uh, Cleveland Clinic Shanghai. Um, and I'm not sure how many applicants they've got. Yes, people will be withdrawing. It's an amazing city, obviously. You know, one of the things I've had the pleasure of coming before and, and, and um, this year, thank you for um, allowing me the privilege of the podium. Uh, one thing that's, I think, lovely about our profession is it, it is very collegial. 
But there's something about your meeting that, I mean, I know people like Raul uh, Rosenthal from uh, back in Los Angeles, but I'm lovely seeing Abe Fingerhut again and just the chance to talk to people. There's something about the atmosphere at your meetings that is very, very special. Um, and don't be humble because I'm sure you know that. It's not like going to many of the other meetings we attend. What do you think the magic sauce is? Um, I, I, I like to think that one major issue is that when I started the meeting in 1990, I kind of broke the formula of inviting only, uh, as faculty, only people from US, UK, Australia, Scandinavia, who whose first language, or at least near first language, was English, and said, you know, there's a lot to be learned from people from Latin America, Argentina, Brazil, from Russia, from China, from Japan, Korea, whatever. And I invited people into Egypt, and I started routinely having on faculty, and I think that made their compatriots and colleagues in their countries very comfortable that I was being inclusive of them on faculty. And so it got a reputation, like, hey, this is a meeting where, you know, we actually gained some respect, it's not just being lectured at by the yes. usual cast of characters. That, I think, may be a, a large part of it, um, because the days are not short, um, the schedule's not light, and mm -hmm. the fact that we're in a beautiful place, uh, it doesn't change when you're inside a room with no yes, windows. Exactly. So exactly. I, I like to think it's the collegiality and, and that it really extended out to these people to participate. And the talks were fantastic. I mean, I have to, again, commend you. The quality of the speakers that you have and the data that's presented, um, the, the videos, there are so many highlights, and, and it's going to be wonderful that the proceedings of this meeting are going to be made available to people who couldn't come so that next time you need a bigger room because yes. this room was packed it was standing room only yes, um, yes. which was excellent what it's always hard to uh, pick a highlight but what did you see at this meeting thus far that has surprised you or you know delighted you well I think knowing that I um, have a lot of people coming here and one, one of the reasons I picked Israel by the way wasn't just the trainees but in this part of the world there's a lot of people who are in need of education that can't necessarily come to North America or even Western Europe such as Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia, uh, some of the former Russian uh, Republic countries, uh, Nepal, India so I raised uh, philanthropic funds from friends which then got transmitted as scholarships to bring people from these places. So a lot of the themes, things like education, <clears throat> your phenomenal talk, absolute first, first rate talk on innovation, things that don't require buying kit for two and a half million dollars that you know can be done just by how do you teach, how do you learn, you know, how do you look at quality, how do you do something in a cost-effective manner. So I think an, an overarching theme, sure we had robotics, but even that it was like cost-effective robotics. Mm -hmm. A lot of this was more like how do you optimize patient care, whether it's minimizing the use of opioids or having a protocol to minimize infection or, or ERAS conversation. Anything, right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this was, was translatable to uh, low middle and lower income countries. And I think that's, to me, that was the most important thing to see that coming across. And, and there's another session like that this afternoon on mentoring and teaching and, you know, and, and, and mental conditioning and all of the other things that are very uh, low budget. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's, it's commendable that you do that. And uh, uh, I think we, we, those of us who are fortunate to live in wealthier countries, uh, forget that and I know you've traveled extensively teaching overseas. I'm going to guess that teaching is probably your main love? Oh, I've got multiple You've ones. got multiple. <laughs> well, multiple list them for me. What, what, are, what are the things that really float Professor Wexner's no, boat? Still, I mean, obviously. Other than Lebanese here, of course. <laughs> Other than my family, you know, yeah. my, Marianne and my kids, uh, my mom and whatnot. But besides for that, Patience. I mean, it all comes down to patience, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the old adage, here we are in Jerusalem, and maybe it was said here, you know, you, you give a man a fish, he has a meal, you teach, uh, teach, teach somebody to fish. to fish, and he has a mm -hmm. meals for life. So taking care of patience still is what turns me on, you know, the gratification of somebody saying to you, you know, thank, thank you, you know, yeah. what you've done, you've saved my life, you've prolonged my life, you've improved the quality of my life, whatever it happens to be, you know, just even thank you, just that people are doing well, you see people, with, with inflammatory bowel disease and abnormal lives, and you see people with cancers who are cured of cancers, and so on. That's what it's all about. Now, 
The teaching part is teaching other people how to get similar outcomes so that they can experience that same That's gratification. Yeah. And I, don't, I certainly don't have a monopoly on, on good outcomes, nor do I have exclusively good outcomes, unfortunately, because I'm honest, and that's, yes. that's what surgery is about. But it's also teaching people how to deal with suboptimal outcomes and adverse outcomes, both from how, how, to, how to minimize the damage to the patient as well as to the surgeon. So yes, the teaching aspect is, is doing that type of a service, and then it ends up multiplying multifold, right? Because you end up impacting the lives not only the patients in whom you can operate, but the patients you teach others in whom to operate and, and so on. You know, uh, your, your comment about uh, being honest. Uh, Sir Robert Shields, who was um, uh, my professor of surgery back at medical school, said that if a surgeon maintained he or she had no complications, he's either not operating or lying. Um, and I remember Bob Beard showing a video, at, I think it was Sage's, um, of complications in cases he had done. Mm -hmm. And hats off for doing that um, because we do learn a lot from uh, the errors that we have, the mistakes, the complications that we have. And, you know, kudos to you for, for doing that. So, just going back in time a bit, I remember when, what made my career choices, and it was, quite frankly, it was people. Right. Um, the the teachers that I had, the surgeons were far more charismatic than the internal medicine doctors, um, and they actually have personality. Whereas, you know, with no disrespect to Mariana, who has a wonderful personality, a lot of pathologists don't. Right? Um, and colorectal seems to um, it seems to entice a lot of really nice people, or is it that doing colorectal surgery makes you really nice? But it's, it's true, isn't it? It hundred percent is true, and I think so is what you say about being attracted by people. I was interested in it because of the people in it, and and the fact that they took an interest in me. Who who, who were some of the people who are not around anymore? Yeah. But the guys in in, in in New York, and and uh, at that point they were all guys in New York, mm -hmm. um, and they got me interested. They brought me to meetings and introduced me to other people, and you know and there you have it. Um, so I, I really enjoyed them as people, but I also enjoyed the variety and the specialty of, mm -hmm. of the type of things you do, big things, little things, inpatient, outpatient. We didn't have laparoscopy at the time, we mm -hmm. did have colonoscopy in a rudimentary form as it were. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that colorectal surgeons maybe you know, have a little bit more um, levity than say a neurosurgeon or a cardiac surgeon does. Um, maybe we take ourselves less serious. I don't know. I'm trying to remember one, one of someone I was talking to here who said the person who graduated, a patient asked him why he got into colorectal and said, well, the guys who graduated number, you know, the top of our class, they all became neurologists and neurosurgeons. He says, I graduated at the bottom, which <laughs> seemed appropriate somehow. Uh, That's a good one. Tell me, I, I had the, the privilege of meeting uh, David Jacobman just very briefly o over the, the years, and I know that you were close. What, uh, tell me one enduring memory of David. Well, I think that there, 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 there's many, but, but one of the things that I think was the most enduring was the way he would always be there for patients. He, you know, he just, don't, don't, don't tell me why I need to see the patient, don't tell, just send me the patient. You know, so mm -hmm. always just be there to service the patient. Whatever it is, just sort it out later. Whereas a lot of others kind of put obstacles in the way, or, oh, I already have uh, two patients during that hour, or I need the records first. And Dave would always talk to me, just, just take care of the patient. You know, the rest of the stuff will sort itself out. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a very, very important thing uh, that, you know, that I learned from a lot of technical things too, but, but certainly that one about just get the patient cared for and the rest will figure itself out is important. And the second one is communication, and I still maintain that habit. He used to send a note to the patient and the patient's doctors every time he saw them in the office, pre-op, post-op, post-hospital discharge, and I, I do that to this day. It, it's not one of these new automated letters from the electronic medical record that it's is a personal, sort of personal communication. personalized letter, and people love it because the patient has a record of what you did, the doctors all know what's going on, and that's a great habit I picked up from them. You know, one of my teachers recommended that you give your home phone number, and he said they'll never use it, but it'll make people, and I think in all the years I, I practiced, I got one telephone call at home from a patient about a medical matter. 
I got many inviting me to dinner and such like, and I share with you, it's, it's, it's a huge privilege. And to quote Osler, he said that a good doctor is available, able, and affable. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that was, uh, was yeah. David Jagerman to a T. Yeah. So switching, um, uh, switching tack a little bit, um, the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer, mm -hmm. can you tell, tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, basically, it, it, the outcomes for rectal cancer have been proven time and again dependent upon how the operation is done, by whom it's done, where it's done, and the setting in which it's done. So surgeons who do a lot of rectal cancer surgery and are able to get circumferentially clear margins with a near total or total mesorectal excision uh, with appropriate use of neoadjuvant therapy uh, are going to have better outcomes conferred on their patients, so lower rates of permanent colostomy, uh, lower rates of local recurrence, and higher rates of survival than surgeons who sort of dabble in it and or, and or do it independently without a multidisciplinary team and or without appropriate pre-op imaging. So this had been proven multiple times in Europe, um, starting with the work from Bill Heald and, and Phil Quirk and, and ultimately then adding on Gina Brown that if you worked as a team and you established centers as had been done in all of the Scandinavian countries plus in England, plus in Ireland, plus Belgium, plus Germany uh, and a few other places you could move the needle and you could show that there were less colostomies being created, fewer rates of local recurrence, more appropriate evidence-based guidelines being followed and uh, better survival. So when I was president-elect of the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, Feza Remzi uh, prompted me to try and do something like this in this country and it had been tried and hadn't succeeded in the past by one of my mentors, David Rothenberger, and I thought to myself the reason was he tried to, to encompass too many groups, medical oncology and radiation oncology. We don't have the same proof about that as we do about using a Gina Brown quality MRI and a Phil Quirk quality pathology specimen and a Bill Heald quality TME. We don't have that, so let's leave that element out for the moment. Secondly, he tried to do it through the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, which in, you know, is, is not necessarily the appropriate host organization for surgeons whose allegiance is to SAGES or the Society of Sur for Surgery of the Alimentary Tract or Society of Surgical Oncology. So I took a different approach and I got a working group together. We spent about four years gathering data from National Cancer Database and, and other forms, put in the literature as, as awareness, showing how outcomes in the U.S. were inferior to Europe showing how outcomes in the U.S. were tremendously variable and needed to improve. So, so we made the cases room for improvement. Um, then I went, having been on the Commission on Cancer and the Accreditation Committee, I presented a proposal to create this program. The Accreditation Committee went for it because by that point we had the evidence. And Mariana Barrow worked with us from College of American Pathology and Judith Yee from American College of Radiology. So I, I included the radiologists and the pathologists just like it had been done in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, only instead of you know Phil and Gina, it was Mariana and Judith here. And we included all four surgical societies with an interest, SSO, SSAT, ASRS, and SAGES. And after the accreditation committee approved it for COC and the executive committee, I then went to the Board of Regents of the ACS because they have to provide the funding and, and they also approved it. So, so that was 2014. We then spent three years working on creating a standards manual we beta tested six sites, of which Cleveland Clinic of Florida is one, Cleveland Clinic of Ohio another. Um, we then had the manual revised, and as of uh, officially October this past year, four months ago, we officially convened the NAPRC. We have an executive committee, so I chair the program and I chair the executive committee. We also have a, a, a quality committee, an accreditation committee, an education committee. Um, so I, we have uh, Virginia Schaefer, I, I selected as chair of our education committee. I selected Tracy Hall, she chairs our uh, accreditation committee. And I believe, I'll do this from memory, it's either Arden Morris or Sam Hendren, uh, Samantha, one of them is, is doing the quality committee. Um, and those groups each have representatives from all six societies. So the composition is very egalitarian. SSO, SAGES, ASRS, 
the SSAT, uh, the SSAT American College of Radiology, College of American Pathologists, each have one seat at the table for each committee, plus the college has four fellows at large for each committee, plus the Resident Affiliate Society and the Young Fellows. So now we're in motion. We now have almost 20 programs accredited. About 60 more have requested accreditation. And the program revolves around processes and, and performance. That's how any Commission on Cancer program works. So you have to show that you're evaluating every patient with rectal cancer before you make a decision how to treat them, that that decision is made as a consensus of the group, and that was alluded to in the meeting mm -hmm. today, that it's, uh, although not in APRC, but, but relative to IBD, I think uh, uh, Andre Dorr may have said it, uh, so who's one of our alumni, uh, that we have this consensus and then treatment starts and the treatment is evidence-based and that you have to practice the uh, optimal standard of care for evidence-based treatment it has to be documented along the way after treatment everything's reassessed so for example we look at the, every MRI on every patient with rectal cancer we decide do we give neoadjuvant or not <clears throat> after surgery Mariana shows us every single specimen on the screen as do the pathologists in the other places and as a surgeon you want to strive for your best performance because you know you're going to have 60 or 80 or 100 people in the room looking at your specimen on a big screen and you certainly don't want it looking like something that you know your dog on earth on a Sunday afternoon from the garden I mean you want it a nice beautiful complete or near complete TME so it's if nothing else it's peer pressure because everybody is knowing what everyone else is doing and ultimately that will translate to improved outcomes for our patients across the country. So uh, I have to take my hat off uh, to you, having run committees at societies and know that it's like trying to herd cats. This is a mammoth task that you've undertaken and have executed. And for people who don't know you, it always blows me away. You're one of only two people I know. I email you about something, you get an answer and it's taken care of. My late dad had a great expression, if you want something done, give it to the busy people, and you're one of the busiest. And I want to be respectful of your time, Steve, and you've got to get back to the meeting. I have a final question for you. What do you think a pithy comment, give me a pithy comment about the biggest challenges facing people who are just starting out in colorectal surgery in terms of either clinical practice or research? What are the big challenges? <clears throat> Well, I, I think the, the big challenge is going to be, there, there are several, I'm not sure it's one big challenge, they're a bit interwoven. Uh, there's a lot of talk about burnout, and mm -hmm. you know, that is lack of job satisfaction in part, in part, in part is being overwhelmed by what we used to call paperwork, now it's typing or dictating in front of a screen. Uh, in part, it's work hour restrict. You know, you're going for an environment with you know the EU restrictions or the US restrictions, and suddenly you're available all the time because there is no restriction in practice, and that can be pretty daunting. So, I think the best way to deal with all of that is you remember why you're doing this, and you're doing this to do the best you can for every single patient every day. And I think if you go in with the attitude that this is a really unique, and I don't, it's not confined to colorectal surgery, but we have the most fabulous, most unique jobs in the world, in my opinion. If you choose to do clinical care, you're going to get the opportunity to help people every day. If you decide to go into administration, you're going to get the opportunity to help direct the healthcare system, which is going to improve people. If you go into innovation, you're going to figure out how to improve lives by giving the clinicians the tools they need. If you're a researcher, if you're an educator, so there are many avenues you can take. So, you know, one thing I would tell people is if, if, you know, just going in, you know, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day is a lot, you know, there are these other avenues within medicine and you, you shouldn't just necessarily, you know, bugger off and become a writer. I mean, maybe you want to, but, but there are other things you can do. There are lots of ways that you can help people without necessarily cutting daily. However, I think the vast majority of people did go into this so they could operate on a daily basis. And just remember why you're doing it. You're yeah. doing it to help people out. What you need to do on a personal level to maintain your sanity, you know, whether that's going to the gym or yoga or being with your family or fishing or flying airplanes or whatever it is, I mean, just make sure you maintain the time to do that. Yeah. But don't get discouraged. They're, not every day is going to be great, but the vast majority of them will be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why should I be surprised that you said that so eloquently? Because everything you do is, is done eloquently, Steve. 
Uh, fabulous talking to you.